So, this could be really long, or it could be really short. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. Every preacher's dream there. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered, and a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. You all know that feeling. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down, bent over him, and taking him in his arms said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until at daybreak, and so departed. And they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. Moral of the story, don't fall asleep if your preacher is a cessationist. Tonight we're going to look at saving Eutychus. Saving Eutychus. We will just barely be squeaking in to the systematic theology category for the Institute as we look at how to listen to a sermon. So we've all heard lots of sermons, I'm sure. And you may be asking yourself, what's the big deal, right? You just listen. Of course, try not to fall asleep. And if you do, at least just don't snore. I keep, I keep some pens under the pulpit, just in case. I'm kidding, I don't. But you just listen. Okay, that's true. But one thing you learn as you study uh, how to read and study the Bible, one thing you learn is the importance of genre. Genre. You need something, uh, or you read something differently depending on what type of literature it is. Right? You read Psalms differently than you read Colossians. You read Shakespeare differently than you read World Magazine. Differently than you read Dilbert. Well, you listen differently to different genres as well. It's not just ears absorbing words, but your mind is engaged in interpreting those words based on the type of thing you're listening to. Right? Think of a voicemail from a coworker versus NPR versus Leonard Skinner versus an intimate conversation with your spouse. Different? Different. Well, since a sermon is something that we listen to every week, and not, not just that, but it's the most important thing you listen to every week. <clears throat> Maybe it's something we should consider understanding more than nuts and bolts of. So first... Just going to be brief here, just in or at least just for this point. Don't get too excited. In order to just clear the road, all right, we're going to uh, lay out what I would say a proper sermon is. Okay, what it should be. I won't dwell on that. But then we'll look at what a sermon does. What a sermon does. And this is going through the mind of of your preachers. I think I can say that confidently here. It's going through the mind of your preachers as we're preparing, as we're preaching. Okay, we're going to dive into how we would expect you, I think, to listen to the genre of a sermon. And then I'll finish with some further practical tips. So, uh, <clears throat> first, when we talk about how to listen to a sermon, this is the kind of sermon I mean. And this is all going to feed into how to listen to a sermon. So we need to clear the road here. First, sermon should be expository. And I mean that in a very broad sense. Okay? I know there's, you know, there's your guys who, who, you know, it's not expository unless you're doing, you know, 
Colossians 1, 15 this week, and then la- because last week you did Colossians 1, 12 to 14. You know what I mean? No. I mean it brought. It could be explaining the whole Bible, and explaining big parts of the Bible, explaining themes of the Bible, or looking at a text. A small, you know, a small passage. But however it is, it should be somehow explaining what God says in His Word. Not using Bible verses to back up what the, what the pulpiteer wants to say. Expository preaching is when the burden of the sermon, the, the thrust, the thesis, the main point, it all comes from Scripture itself. And you, you should be able to see that clearly in the Scripture. And then that burden is explained and exhorted by the Scripture. So first, expository, what a sermon should be. Second, Christ-centered. All right? Now, Christ-centered, uh, a Christ-centered sermon isn't just one that happens to talk about Jesus, right? We're going through Matthew. So, yeah, all of my sermons <laughs> over the last however long it's been. I won't say. I know, but I won't say. Uh, you know, they're all Jesus-centered, right? No, that's not what I mean. It, it, Jesus said a Christ-centered sermon isn't just one that, you know, talks about something and then at the end, uh, you know, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you know, even though that doesn't have anything to do with what the sermon was about. That's not what I'm getting at. But a Christ-centered sermon is where uh, 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 gospel, well, gospel-driven, whatever catchword you want to you wanna call it, is where the thrust of the sermon and the exhortation of the sermon or application... Uh, if you will, that comes from it is only meaningful through the work of Christ. Okay, so the power, the motivation, the comfort, the conviction, the joy, the peace, whatever it is that comes from the exhortation must be bound up in the person and work of Christ. So it's not try really hard to serve one another, right? Because that's what good Christians do and you'll make God mad at you if you don't. Right? That's not a Christ-centered application. A Christ-centered application, Christ-centered sermon is look at how Christ has given everything in service of you. Now you go and serve Him by serving others. And do it in the strength that He supplies for His glory. You see, it's a little bit different, right? Okay, so what's a sermon? I said I was going to be brief. This is me being brief. What's a sermon? Expository, first, holding forth the word of life. Second, it's Christ-centered, gospel-driven, holding forth the bread of life. Both of these are going to feed into what we're going to look at later. So now everything that flows here tonight, okay, I'm assuming that that's what's going on, all right? That's the kind of sermon I'm getting at. But now I want to look more at what a sermon is, okay? What it, uh, what it, 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 what it does, the actual event, of preaching. And this is geared for you. This is not a, a lecture for, for pastors or preachers. Okay? What is a sermon intended to do? So, tonight you will be spelunking into the crevices of the mind of a preacher. How lucky you are. I wish you the best of luck. Uh, and I pray that this will be for your benefit. Alright, preaching. Much has been made about the differences between teaching and preaching. I'm not really going to draw out lines here, but I think we all know there's a difference, right? You have a different experience sitting here on a Sunday morning than you do sitting downstairs on a Sunday later, I guess later in Sunday morning, as for, you know, for Sunday school or Bible study or something. Everything that a teaching event do, a preaching event should do, but with more involved. Right? Teaching is not preaching, but preaching in part is teaching. And there's at least two aspects of a sermon, the teaching part of a sermon that you need to be listening to. Okay? Like I said, all this is going through our minds as preachers, and I just have the wonderful opportunity to explain it to you tonight, which we probably all want to do. All right, first th- or two things. First uh, thing to listen to in the teaching part, uh, this is crazy earth-shattering here. But a sermon is teaching you the Bible, right? So listen theologically. Listen theologically. Don't just wait for the bang at the end, but engross yourself in the theology of the text, in the passage, uh, engross yourself in the biblical data 
that's being presented and explained. Don't worry if you don't remember every little detail. Okay, we don't expect you to. That's all right. Don't remember if you remember every explanation or every fact. But what you need to do is, is let it shape your worldview. Let it shape your worldview. Who is God? Right? What is man? Who is Christ? What did he do? What's the overarching plan for this world? And how do I fit in it? From this teaching category, I think this is the biggest, the biggest thing. You need to learn more about the Bible. You need to allow that learning to shape who you are. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a little ruthless in this tonight. So just I'm coming gently, but I can, I can finally say it. If history is boring to you, then pray about that. Okay? Don't just say the preacher is too scholarly or he's supposed to like stuff like that. Right? Or he's boring or whatever. Granted, maybe <laughs> I've listened to some boring preachers and sometimes that happens. But maybe you're the one who needs to change. This is a history book, and you need to know it. A sermon is not something to help you with your problems, uh, to, 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 to show you how to live a good Christian life per se, or to feel better about yourself, but it's teaching you how to think biblically. And second, a, a, a sermon is teaching you how to think hermeneutically. Hermeneutics is how to read, how to study, how to interpret the Bible. So you shouldn't just be listening for uh, what the preacher is saying. You should also be kind of listening to behind what he is saying. Like uh, how he's getting at what he's saying. Right? You don't get much out of reading the Gospels or the Psalms or Deuteronomy. And listen to how your preacher explains it. Okay, delve into his method. How is he interpreting it? How is he applying it? Where is he going with it? If you're listening, he's teaching you how to read and study the Bible. So listen with your mind. Engage it. Put it in gear. So first, what a sermon does, it teaches. Listen with your mind. You have one, right? You're to love God with it. So engage it. Second, a sermon exhorts. Sermon exhorts. So listen with your heart. A sermon isn't just to train your mind, but a sermon is to reach into your soul, pull out the weeds, and plant flowers. Okay? It's to change your desires, to change your heart's motivations. It's to convict you of sinful actions, sinful thinking, sinful passions. And to restore you to the grace of God in Christ. 2 Timothy 3.16 All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So listen with your heart. And listen humbly. Right? Come realizing that, that you don't know it all. The preacher doesn't either. But he's been studying this all week. And, and then some. Come realizing that you don't have it all together. Be prepared to have your heart biopsied and worked on by the great physician. The sermon, I believe, is God's primary means for your spiritual edification. You may disagree with that, and that's okay. We can talk about that later. But it's at least high up on the list. So allow the Spirit of God to convict you of wrong beliefs, wrong motivations, wrong practices, wrong desires. Come humbly, come thirsty for the righteousness and the power of Christ. Come willing and expecting to be changed on the inside. It may hurt, but that's how it has to be. If you sit through a sermon without the spotlight of God's conviction beaming into your soul. And you're probably not listening to the sermon that's the way that you should be. But yet, if you stay under that conviction, 
right? And are never lifted, if you're a believer, and are never lifted to the heights of God's grace in Christ, then you're probably not listening to the sermon the way you should be. Again, all, of course, the preacher is preaching the way he should be. I'll, I'll admit, we don't always. But all this kind of funnels into what I really want to get at. A sermon is teaching, a sermon is exhorting, but it's still more than that. Okay? A sermon is literally, literally, not metaphorically or figuratively or ethereally or whateverly. It's literally God speaking to you. As the preacher presents, explains, and exhorts the words of God, that is the Holy Spirit communicating His truth and His grace to your soul. I can't compare this to anything else. It's different than reading your Bible on your own. It's different than studying with a commentary or a devotional. It's different than watching a video Bible study on YouTube or whatever it is. This is God's speech act to His people. Okay, God breathed life into this world by speaking it into existence. God breathes life into your soul by speaking to it. And He speaks to it okay, by the Holy Spirit through the preacher by way of the sermon. The sermon, it, because of that, through that, it produces an instant change in your soul through the Spirit's working. It's instant. It's in the moment. It's right away as the Word of God is being preached. The teaching, the exhortation, they're necessary. But they're secondary. Okay, They're the hoe that the preacher uses to prepare the soil of your heart for the Spirit to come and to plant His seeds of God's grace in your soul and mature them to abundant fruits. You need a text for that? Good. You can go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. This is Pentecost. Spirit comes. Peter is preaching. Of course it's Peter. Not one of the other disciples. Peter's preaching. And he's explaining the Scriptures to them. How Christ fulfills them, why He's come, and then what happens. Verse 37. Now when they heard this, it's the crowd, they were what? They were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what it is. Right? That's what a sermon does, isn't it? It cuts to the heart. It's God's Word through the Spirit. That's the double-edged sword, isn't it? God's Word does the slicing and dicing in your soul. But it's the sermon that unleashes it. More so than any other genre of Bible presentation. Okay, that's why I made a deal in the beginning about sermons being some kind of Christ-centered exposition. Because it's, it's, it's the power of Christ through the Word of God. It's not the preacher, right? It's not the pulpit. It's not the time or the place per se. But it's the exposed and the unfettered Word of God that gives a sermon its power. A sermon is God's Word unleashed in all of its power, in all of its capacities. It's not just a teaching session with, with little or, or no kneading of your soul. I guess you need it this way. It's not just exhortation or application that's devoid okay, of, of the truth and the doctrine of the Scriptures that gives you the motivation, that gives you the power, that changes your mind to go and do that application. The sermon cuts to the heart. You may not be able to put your finger on it exactly how or when or what, 
And that's okay. But if you're listening, you leave, I think, cut to the heart. Where you, you leave the sermon changed in some way. The teaching is good, but if that's what you're focusing on, then, then you've missed it. Sometimes there will be like good teaching points that I won't uh, really dwell on in a sermon. Okay, or I'll just leave them out altogether, depending on you know what it is. If I think it's going to kind of get you hung up in, uh, in in some vain discussions in your mind, those teachings are good and they're necessary and they're important to talk about, and, and we'll talk about them in other venues. All right, but a sermon isn't just meat for the mind, but it's manna for the soul. So if you're like a biblical scholar sitting under a sermon and you're like, boy, this is, this is pretty weak. <laughs> Maybe it is. It could be. But remember, the main point is your soul, right? And yes, I know the mind is the doorkeeper to the soul. Sermon should always be thick with text and theology, but it needs to be swallowed. And the opposite. If you're a, a biblical infant, keep listening. Right? Be diligent to try to grasp the teaching with your mind. But don't be overcome by it. Don't give up or get lost. Your understanding will come, but for now, let it wash over your soul. Then go back and study it and ask questions. And that's okay. The sermon is more than teaching. It's more than trying to get some good applications out. It's not a motivational talk or some kind of Christian pep rally. It's God speaking directly to you. And He's affecting an instant change in your heart. Mm, It's pretty high and mighty. I know, coming from a preacher, right? Remember, that changes. It happens. But it's slow. Isn't it? This is why we do this once a week, at least. Okay, over years and years and years of our lives. A change happens, but it's not really usually a complete overhaul of your life in an hour, right? They're small, they're incremental changes. It's a lifelong metamorphosis, not a 45-minute long transformation into the image of Christ. But a sermon cuts to the heart. So here, if I could leave you with the most important thing that you need to do, this is it you should be preparing your heart to hear it. Okay? The preacher is praying all week for this thing. He's praying for you. You should be praying as well for you and for him. Let me just throw that out there too. But the sermon's not a college lecture, right? It's not a safety meeting at work. You know, you're like you just got to go there and, and sit through it. This is divine interaction between you the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God. So prepare for it prayerfully. Ask God to prepare your heart, to make it supple, to to give you a willingness to be convicted, to shatter your pride and to open your eyes. Put that at least, at least on your Sunday morning before church routine. Pray desperately that God speak to you through the sermon. And then don't say amen to that prayer until after He answers it through the sermon. That's what I want to press you into here this morning. Or this afternoon, yeah, tonight, whatever, whatever time of day it is. So how to listen to a sermon thus far? Listen theologically. Listen hermeneutically. Listen with your mind. Listen with your heart. Listen with your soul. And do it all in prayer. Finally, I have some more disjointed uh, practical tips. This is, seriously, this is just from a preacher because I can. (laughs) First, there's a common objection I've heard to sermons. And it goes something like this. What about learning styles? What about learning styles? The sermon is usually geared for auditory learners. But what about those visual and kinesthetic learners? 
Well, you're going to have to take that one up with God. Learning styles are good and helpful, okay? But they're invented by man, aren't they? What I mean to say is that don't feel incapacitated outside of your learning style. Don't close yourself into a box and say, well, if we're not going to have any motions, I'm not going to learn anything. Okay? Don't do that. If there's no PowerPoints or videos or dances to do, you can handle it. Okay? God is a speaking God, isn't He? God is a speaking God, so that means that we have to be a listening people. So if you have trouble sitting for 45 minutes to listen to a sermon, then pray about that. The first thing you need to do is not go and complain to your preacher. The first thing you need to do is, is pray about it and ask God to give you whatever it takes to sit there for however long He's going to preach. Okay? I mean, just fall asleep. <laughs> That's what Eutychus did, isn't it? <laughs> he didn't say, Paul, you're going too long. No, he just fell asleep. All right, I can handle that. But discipline your mind and beat your body into submission if that's what it takes. Right? I bet we don't complain about uh, that TV shows are an hour long. Right? I know maybe your lazy boy isn't as comfortable as the pews are, but that's it's different. And remember too, as far as learning styles go, your chief objective of a sermon is not learning as we usually define it, per se. Okay, but it's the instant work of grace mediated through the Spirit to effect an instant change in the soul of the hearer. God ordained preaching okay, as the primary means of edification. That means we need to be studious listeners. Second, I'm going to try not to look at anybody as I'm going through these things. Note takers, beware. Handouts are fine. Taking notes is fine. But if you're a note taker, be careful. Your goal is not to fill in the blank. Okay? Or record every cross reference. It's not to jot down a detailed exposition of the text. You need to be listening to the whole thing. To be honest, as a preacher, I prefer that nobody took notes. That's that's I, not the Lord. Okay? Just go with that. It may be nice to go back throughout the week and review the sermon. That's good. But honestly, I really don't care if you do. Okay? That's not my intent. Maybe some preachers are different. I don't know. But that's not my intent. If that's what gets you into the Word throughout the week, then great. Okay? But uh, I really... I told you I'm going to be ruthless tonight, but um, I really couldn't care less if that is the text I preached on or not. It really doesn't matter to me. Okay? Leftovers are fine, but it's, uh, it's not as good as getting the full glory, I think, of the main course as it's served. But if that's what you like to do, and it's working out, you can focus on the sermon. Okay? Maybe, maybe I'd have a different learning style than you do. Whatever. Don't let me interrupt that or make you change it. You, but I think it would behoove you to consider. Third, this is a living book. So constantly be thinking about how you fit into the sermon. Whether or not the preacher brings it home. The disciples are worried about and afraid of the storm. Oh, hmm. there's a storm in my life been worrying me as well. Let's see what happens and who Jesus uh, reveals Himself to be that would encourage me through that trial. Even if I have to be called out, ye of little faith. So before the sermon even starts, get your mind and heart ready to interact with the text. There's so much in a text of Scripture. And we, we preachers pretty much always have to leave a lot in the chopping block. You try to have one main point, one main bullet to the, that, 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 that shoots to your soul, 
But there's a lot of subpoints in the text, lots of meaningfully applicable material that we may or may not really draw out. I don't dwell on those things, right? I just try to throw a hook in the water and get you thinking, get the spirit stirring in you. The main points where I bait the hook, right? Cast it right in front of you and, and set it. At least that's what I try to do. But usually because of time or clarity or emphasis or just keeping your attention, I can't focus on everything. So it's up to you, okay, to swim over in your minds and in your souls and take some nibbles on all those other little lures that I cast it out. If the Spirit's leading you to do that. And finally, along with that, have a freedom to let your mind wander. Now, not about lunch, not about football or the altar flowers, okay? That's sinful. But if the preacher's halfway through the sermon and you're chowing down on one of those secondary lures, right? The Spirit's convicting you, He's encouraging you, or just doing whatever He's doing in you, then run with it, okay? He's bringing other verses to mind, then go look them up if you have to. He's working in you. And that's what it's all about, isn't it? The Spirit's instant affecting of God's grace in your soul. It doesn't matter if that comes from three alliterated points or not. If you miss the last half of the sermon because God's working in your soul, then praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The sermon is for God's glory. That He might be glorified in you. It's not for the glory of the preacher. So if God's being glorified in your soul while that sermon is being preached and you're way off somewhere else, you know, you've moved miles away from that sermon, but He's working in you, then drawing you to a deeper repentance and faith, and then that's mission accomplished. And then go tell your preacher. Because that will humble him and it will excite him. So hopefully you can take some of these points with you tonight. Put them into practice. Preachers should never stop working at becoming better preachers. And you should never stop working at becoming better sermon listeners. The responsibility of the sermon does not lie squarely on the preacher. But you have a big responsibility as well. Okay, maybe your preacher's not the greatest. I know what four of four of you in here that don't have the greatest preacher. But maybe you're not the greatest listener. You should be putting as much effort into listening to a sermon well as your preacher is putting into preparing it. Not, not as much time per se, I'm not saying that, but as much effort, as much prayer as well. He doesn't do this for himself. He does it. He does it for you. So engage your mind. Engage your heart in prayer. And at the very least, your name won't come up when all those kids talk about who fell asleep in church this morning. Trust me, that happens. <laughs> At least it does in this church. <laughs> or it used to. Let's pray.